Hello, welcome. I'm just going to give a minute for folks to join our room. It's terrific to see everybody, but I can't actually see you, but welcome. Just wait a, just a couple more seconds as our room opens up. So good afternoon. I'm Jocelyn Kennedy, the executive director of the Harvard Law School Library. Welcome. We're so delighted to have you here for our Harvard Law School Library Faculty Book Talk series. This talk is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. You can check out our scholarship at Law Blog for more information. I want to thank Dean Manning for his generous support of these talks and a really big thank you to our team, Maya Berger Moscow, Debbie Ginsburg, Annie. Anna Martin, Rachel Parker, and Teresa Knapp for putting together this series. Please visit your local bookseller or your local library, um, including the Harvard Coop, for a copy of today's book, Mental Health, Legal Capacity, and Human Rights. We have an amazing panel with us today. Briefly, I will introduce Michael Ashley Stein, the co-founder and executive director of the Harvard Law School Project on Disability. Vikram Patel is the Pershing Square Professor of Global Health in the Blavatnik Institute's Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Gerald Newman is the J. Sinclair Armstrong Professor of International Foreign and Comparative Law and Director of the Human Rights Program here at the law school. Alberto Vasquez is a senior advisor at the Center for Inclusive Policy. Lydia X. Z. Brown is a member is a policy is a member of policy and policy council for disability rights and algorithmic fairness for the Privacy and Data Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology and director of policy advocacy and external affairs for the Autistic Women and Nonbinary Network. Alicia Ely Yaman is an adjunct professor on global health and population at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and affiliated faculty member of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. I'm gonna turn it over to um, Professor Stein to get us started. Thank you so much everyone for being here. Thank you everyone for being here and thank you, Jocelyn. A few thank yous of my own. Um, one to the Harvard Law School Library and all the librarians there. You are fantastic and a complete joy to work with. Um, and I thank you for empowering all of us on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, to my wonderful co-editor Vikram um, and to our wonderful co-editors who are not with us today, Faraz and Charlene, we appreciate you. We thank you. And to Juliana, who is with us, thank you for your editorial assistance. We have a number of our authors here today, but the vast majority are not, and we thank them as well uh, for their wonderful contributions. And of course, to the Weatherhead Center, which initiated the funding for the workshop which, from which the volume arose. Um, on mental health, legal capacity, and human rights, we are, legally speaking, looking at Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I had the privilege of being involved in the negotiations for the convention and in its implementation uh, in over 40 something countries in the 20 or so years ever since. Article 12 was and is the most controversial and the least understood uh, of the articles within the CRPD, um, not on its basic premise that persons with disabilities should have be recognized as having equal legal capacity and standing before the law, and not in the sense that they should receive when necessary supports from states in terms of making decisions and expressing their voices and preferences and being able to control their lives. But at the convention itself and following, um, there has been a number of dialogues and discourses often heated that have been arising from Article 12. Initially, during the negotiations, the questions arose such as, can everyone always have full legal capacity, even with enormous supports? Are there any groups that at any point in time cannot make those decisions on their own behalf, in which case uh, 
is there the vehicle known as guardianship or otherwise that can substitute those decisions? The states and some of them were quite vociferous in arguing yes. The disability rights community was quite adamant in arguing no. The final provision clearly lays out that everyone has legal capacity and should receive supported decision-making and yet, and yet, the reservations that have been made against the CRPD, even by human rights abiding states, such as Norway, Australia, the United Kingdom, have aimed at Article 12 and differing interpretations presented by those states. Um, and although the CRPD committee in issuing its general comment and its first general comment, showing you what its priorities were, has expressed the idea that there is always full legal capacity. No one can ever be involuntarily detained, either as a danger to themselves or to others. Supported decision-making almost must be provided. Still questions remain, such as, if we don't know someone's will and preference, how in fact can we use the best interpretation of their will and preference? We have substituted best interpretation for best interests in the general comment and in its guidance. But what does that mean if we haven't met them? Can healthcare providers try to act differently or should they act the same at the point of contact when engaging with persons with various sorts of disabilities? Uh, who are in danger to themselves, but are having difficulty in expressing those preferences. We have seen courts now pushing back somewhat against the issue of full capacity at all times. For example, the German Constitutional Court has overtly criticized the CRPD's interpretation, and the European Court of Human Rights has implicitly questioned it by stepping back a bit on the issue of voting. But some issues, of course, remain unresolved, such as when we talk about getting rid of guardianship and instead putting in supported decision-making, does that mean that the courts, usually family court, probate court, and so on, that render guardianship decisions are now going to become supported decision-making panels? Are judges to be ousted and instead social workers, psychiatrists, or others put in? What is the difference between a bad supported decision maker and a very good guardian? All in all, the questions remain, how do we in culturally resource and otherwise appropriate manners? Because the world is very large and the 184 countries that have ratified the CRPD differ in terms of their resources, their perspectives and their cultures. How do we enable best persons with disabilities to express their wills and preferences in human rights abiding manners. And that is a work in progress. It's a fascinating work. It is one that is often fraught with dialogue um, and with, with heated discussions, and that's as it should be. So it's been an absolute pleasure, Professor Patel, and I turn over to you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, what I want to do is to really discuss the implications of the CRPD um, for a rights-based approach to mental health care uh, and the need for the profession to which I belong, that of psychiatry, to align its practices to the CRPD, in particular, the contentious Article 12 that Michael has spoken to. And indeed, this is a theme that runs across the entire book. I want to turn uh, the clock back to 1995 when a landmark report was published by my department at Harvard Medical School called the World Mental Health Report. It was a landmark report because it reframed mental health not as a biomedical issue, but as a global development issue. It did so by documenting something that we all fully recognize today, the powerful influence of structural forces on mental health such as, for example, the impoverishment of large numbers of people through neoliberal economic policies, and of course, historically through colonialism, the systematic subjugation of entire groups in the population, for example, women in patriarchal societies, the trauma and loss experienced by millions affected by conflicts, such as we witness right now, fueled by commercial or sectarian interests, and the historic marginalization and dispossession of indigenous peoples and persons with disabilities. One amongst this very many uh, range of examples of structural forces was the overbearing hierarchical dominance of a very narrow biomedical model, uh, 
exemplified by the profession of psychiatry on mental health care. This not only emphasized that mental health care was the prerogative, the protected territory of psychiatry, but also protected the profession under whose watch coercion and incarceration had become the cornerstones of care, in particular for inpatient care for people with serious mental health problems and disabilities. Back in the 1990s, I was living and working in Zimbabwe, and I was particularly anguished by the harrowing and, of course, completely preventable suffering and death and human rights abuses experienced by people living with HIV AIDS in Southern Africa. And what really moved me at the time was a language of rights propelled by people who were living with HIV that, of course, transformed the science of life-saving medicines into something we now recognize today as perhaps the origin story of global health itself, making access to care a right. I was deeply inspired by the leadership of people living with HIV who ensured through unrelenting sacrifice and activism, the enshrining of the rights to care and indeed the right to freedom. We may forget that that was a period when people with HIV were also incarcerated in many parts of the world to protect the community, as it were, from their dreaded virus. This was, of course, the moral foundation of the global AIDS response in the late 90s. And I saw many parallels between this crusade and what needed to be done in the field of global mental health by embracing a rights-based approach to addressing the consequences of structural violence on the lives of people with mental illness. And initially, my attention focused on the right to care, and I particularly sought to challenge the, the narrow biomedical prism of doctors, diagnoses, and drugs, and the dominance of psychiatry. And again, I'll freely disclose I'm a member of that profession. I didn't make many friends there to address the injustice experienced by people with mental illness through the denial of access to quality care in the community that could support their recovery, and indeed to avert any need of involuntary treatment at all. Much of my work focused on leveraging community resources, including peer support workers, to deliver psychosocial in interventions. Today, the large and compelling body of implementation science that supports the effectiveness of this approach called task sharing for a wide range of mental health problems has laid the foundation for a transformed vision of mental health care in which communities can utilize the resources they already have to actually address mental health care. In conclusion, as I expanded my efforts towards addressing the right to care, it became quickly evident that there were a number of other fundamental, fundamental basic rights that were being systematically denied to persons with mental illness. And of course, these are the very rights uh, that we are talking about today. The rights to freedom, to dignity, to choice and inclusion. And of course, the right to be heard. These are the rights enshrined more broadly in the CRPD and more specifically in Article 12. And we as mental health professionals owe a debt to the movements of persons with psychosocial disability who have successfully shone the spotlight on the cruel and inhumane ways in which people with intellectual disabilities and serious mental health problems have been treated across time and geography, right up to modern times where incarceration, involuntary and coercive treatment in both traditional and psychiatric care facilities, exclusion from social spaces, and the denial of civil rights continue to be perpetrated in many, many parts of the world, too many. Even in the most progressive societies, such as in the US and Europe, people with mental illness experience scandalous levels of premature mortality, much of it due to the structural violence they have to bear in their daily lives. In closing then, it is clear to me that the right to care, which is a fundamental right to avoid coercion in the long run, must be aligned immediately with the right to freedom, dignity, agency, and inclusion. And it is only through the realization of these rights that the real elephant in the room that we are all concerned with, the stigma and discrimination experienced by people day to day in their daily lives when they are experiencing mental illness, will ultimately be put to rest. And it is also absolutely clear to me that psychiatry, as a dominant medical discipline charged with mental health care, must play an enabling role as an equal partner with civil society to realize 
the ultimate goal of Article 12 and the CRPD, a world where persons with mental health problems are entitled to receive the care they desire with dignity and compassion. I hand over now to Gerald Newman. Thank you, Vikram. Uh, I'm very grateful to the editors for inviting me to contribute to this important book uh, and for giving me this chance today to pay tribute to it. Uh, the areas of law and practice discussed in the book are so subject to abuse and so badly in need of reforms. And the question of how reforms can be implemented in different places and at different times are so multifarious that numerous forms of experience and research are needed to light the ways forward. I am a law professor and an older person. Uh, the title of my chapter in the book is Divergent Human Rights Approaches to Capacity and Consent. Uh, that title essentially conveys the central content. Uh, there is more than one human rights approach to these questions. Uh, the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities seeks to enforce across the board an absolute notion of legal capacity and consent. Uh, for that committee, Substituted decision-making on any issue can never be justified, regardless of the factual circumstances. Uh, to give the examples most relevant to our discussion today, uh, involuntary treatment, restraint, or hospitalization is never permitted, no matter what the consequences are for the person in question. Uh, this prohibition is immediately effective. Other approaches treat actual consent as an ideal that it may not always be possible to achieve uh, and seek to limit involuntary treatment, restraint, or confinement to the greatest extent possible while taking into account the risk of death or serious injury. Uh, other human rights institutions follow such an approach, uh, including the Human Rights Committee at the global level, uh, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, and the German Constitutional Court. Both of these are human rights-based approaches. And the second version is in fact more consistent with the rest of human rights law. Uh, human rights law usually defines discrimination as a matter of unjustified differential treatment, not as differentiation per se. And it defines arbitrary detention as restriction of physical liberty without proportionate justification. Uh, these other institutions do not ignore the pronouncements of the CRPD committee, but they are not persuaded to incorporate its absolutist interpretation of its convention in their own systems. Uh, they have engaged in what is called judicial dialogue with the committee, uh, and in some instances in live consultation with the committee. Uh, I participated in such consultations when I was a member of the Human Rights Committee. The other institutions have learned from the CRPD committee and from the convention, uh, and they have tightened their standards for justification, uh, but they have not eliminated the possibility that there may sometimes be justification. Uh, the opinions of the German Constitutional Court have explicitly called attention to a problem that the CRPD's committee's preference for absolute rules repeatedly raises. Uh, the committee demands immediate abolition of existing practices and institutions without providing implementable answers to the question of what should replace them. I agree completely with the call to reduce involuntary treatment and the aspiration to find ways to eliminate it by making it unnecessary. Uh, the two approaches would converge if substituted decision-making were never necessary. Uh, many chapters in this book describe promising ways of making supported decision-making possible for more and more people in the world. In my chapter, I also discuss the example of dementia. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, uh, in 2015, dementia affected 47 million people worldwide. Uh, there are different kinds of dementia and different degrees of severity. Uh, without overgeneralizing, 
Uh, there are millions of people who are unable to engage in the kind of decision-making that the absolutist approach hypothesizes. Research may find ways to prevent severe dementia uh, or even to cure it, uh, and more effective ways to support those people with dementia who can be supported. Uh, but in the meantime, the issue should not just be ignored and the people abandoned to their theoretical freedom of action. Uh, to be clear, I'm not saying that the current wishes of a person with moderate or severe dementia are irrelevant uh, or that they should always yield to someone else's estimate of the person's best interest. Rather, I argue in the chapter that there are situations of severe harm where the individual's uncomprehending choice should not be given the exclusive focus that the absolutist approach demands. In short, there is not only one approach to legal capacity and consent that is based in human rights. Uh, and the CRPD's committee's approach may not be the best one for immediate and universal implementation. Uh, there needs to be more discussion around these issues uh, and the chapters of this book are a magnificent contribution. Thank you. Uh, and I give the word now to Alberto Vasquez. Thank you, and, and well, good, good, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and, and thank you very much for today's invitation, and especially to the editors for inviting me to be part of this book. And, and for those who are not familiar with the book, my chapter is called The Potential of the Legal Capacity Reform in Peru to Transform Mental Health Provision. Very, very hopeful chapter, I hope. And, and we, what I try to describe is how the legal capacity reform that we achieve in Peru uh, can have important implications for transforming mental health services. And as many as of you may know, Peru was one of the first countries to conduct a significant legal reform on legal capacity of persons with disabilities. And the legal capacity reform in Peru amended the civil code and other pieces of legislation basically to achieve three things. One, to recognize the legal capacity of all persons with disabilities in all aspects of life. Second, abolish guardianship and other forms of, of other restrictions to legal capacity. And third, it introduced supported decision-making options, including the individual appointment of supporters, both judicially and notarized, advanced decisions, and finally, an exceptional judicial appointment of supporters when the individual cannot express the will and preference by any means. And in this particular case, the legislation provides for a framework of best interpretation of will and preference. And as you can see, this was a significant reform, particularly in the context of a country with a civil law tradition, where the civil code is at the core of private law including contract law, property law, family law, tort law, is a very important piece of legislation for us. And as many of you also may be aware, other Spanish speaking countries have passed similar reforms in the last years, including Costa Rica, Colombia, and more recently, although with some limitations, Spain. But a common denominator, I would say, among all these reforms is that the relationship with mental health legislation has not been clearly addressed. And of course, that relationship should be apparent, respecting the right to legal capacity on equal basis with others will include respecting the right to healthcare based on free and informed consent. But it seems that getting rid of guardianship has been easier than ending coercive practices in, in, in mental health legislation. And and as, as Michael mentioned, you know, coercive practices, including involuntary hospitalization and involuntary treatment, are forms of substitute decision making. We can discuss um, if, 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 if they are permitted or not under the international human rights framework, but I think we will agree all that are all forms of substitute decision making because a third person, normally a, a, a medical practitioner, a judge, will decide on, this, on behalf of the person concerned, and often based on risk to self or others or lack of capacity. And in the case of, of the Peruvian reform, it actually addressed 
institutionalization, but there is no direct reference to coercive practices. And this gap, I think, became apparent when in Peru we started discussing new legislation on mental health. And this is the year 2019. And the, it was the first time in Peru we adopted a mental health act. Um, and it's interesting to see how the initial draft of this mental health act, like most standing alone mental health legislations, included a section on involuntary commitment and treatment. But thanks to the legal capacity reform that actually created awareness, civil society and parliamentarians managed to change the, the draft to take out such provisions. But the one provision remained, which is the rule that informed consent is not necessary in case of psychiatric emergencies or mental health emergencies, which echoes a provision that is in actually general health law that provides that informed consent is not required in case of medical emergencies. And I think this is something we don't often realize that apart from provisions on involuntary commitment or treatment, countries normally will have legislation regulating informed consent in the case of medical emergencies. And those provisions will also apply in the case of psychiatric emergencies. And the problem is they are not really applied in a non-discriminatory manner. The criteria is often very different, broader. And for example, while during a medical emergency, a general medical emergency, a person may be able to refuse care, this may not be the case during a mental health emergency. No? So going back to the Peruvian reform, so we managed to get the mental health act without legislation of involuntary treatment, but we still got this exception in the case of emergency. And, 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 and we could continue this discussion because some may argue actually that a broad exception on, on psychiatric emergencies or mental health emergencies actually could be even more dangerous and problematic than having a formal regulation of coercive measures. Uh, because it's, the criteria could be too broad. But what I was trying to bring into the chapter is how important it is to have the legislation on legal capacity because it really helped for regulations of mental health to start closing that bridge. For example, the new regulations that were adopted in 2020 for the first time addressed the fact of legal capacity in mental health legislation in Peru and actually emphasized the importance of informed consent and introduce concepts like reasonable accommodation and bad planning, support decision making in the framework of mental health services, which I think is very positive. But beyond that, regulations also made a step forward and prohibit a series of measures that I would say are permitted in most countries, if not all countries, like isolation, lock rooms, involuntary ECT, but even expressly prohibits involuntary administration of psychotropic drugs. And of course, a clear omission on this list is, is restraints, which has been permitted still. But I think I, I found particularly significant that this step was taken. And I don't think this step would have been taken if there was no legal capacity to reform behind. And finally, in the case of this exception of to inform in the case of emergencies, I think something very interesting is Reframing that discussion is making, for example, take away the whole notion of danger to others. And also the regulations are calling for interdisciplinary responses, for de-escalation, and for acknowledging that people with psychosocial disabilities may actually be able to refuse treatment even during an emergency. And, and, and there is an interesting development on that. No? It has been really difficult to evaluate the impact of these new provisions because of the COVID pandemic. And as you may know, Peru was one of the countries hit hardest by, and many services actually were closed for a long time. But what, what we do know is that there is a significant gap still between statutory law and practice. And actually just in recent months, an organization I, I chair in Peru, Sociedad de Capacidad Solis, we have filed a couple of habeas corpus aiming to challenge involuntary commitments in private facilities. And, and of course, this shows the challenge we're still facing the ground, but also shows that these legal actions will never be possible without the legal context we have today and the current mental health legislation. Actually, it may be the first time we always say when, when we look at these cases that we have the national law on our side. And, and we're doing now qualitative research on how emergency services are working to understand better how this, where we stand to, today, 
But I think it's encouraging to see how, for example, the Ministry of Health is working now in developing guidance on advanced directives, digitalization, peer involvement in service provision, all of these because we have a new system that allows legal capacity to be at the center. And just to close to say, I think in the end, it's better services, better processes, alternative services is what will help us to move away from coercive services. But this is the law of foundational act aspect for this to happen, to enable this to happen. And for a long time, we heard this was not possible. And, and as we heard, it was not possible to end guardianship. But thankfully, I think things are starting to change. And I just stop there. And let me hand the floor to, to Lydia XC Brown. Thank you. Hello, this is Lydia. My pronouns are they, them. I'm a youngish East Asian person with short black and teal hair. Today I'm wearing a dark blue zip up and behind me is a blurred set of shelves with books and other knickknacks on them. Um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. And also thank you to the uh, all of the editors and folks, Juliana, Vikram, Michael, uh, and others who helped to compile this volume and for inviting myself and my partner, Shane, who are uh, who is not here today with us to contribute a chapter um, to this volume. Shane and I wrote specifically about the experiences of hyper marginalized disabled people, that is disabled people who are at the margins of the margins in experiencing the brunt of human rights violations through coercion and forced or involuntary treatment. And in particular, the societal and cultural attitudes of ableism that, that presume that we are incompetent, that we are burdensome and that we are dangerous and that therefore the appropriate legal mechanisms to respond to our existence in society must include some measures of control or enforcement of expectations for compliance. We addressed a few different areas where this has taken place, including in response to acts of mass violence that plague the United States in particular, as well as through restriction of reproductive freedom and restriction of ability to actually to actually enact and to exercise one's agency and autonomy, whether through the use of forced treatment orders or the institution of guardianship over people's lives. But I'd like to take the opportunity to speak a little bit about how Shane and I have been expanding upon the conversation that I hope we were able to contribute to starting through our chapter. Over the last few months, Shane and I have thought quite a bit about exactly what we've just been discussing in the, in the last few presentations today of if we recognize the harms and the violence of tools of coercion and of forced or involuntary treatment as often applied to disabled people, particularly people with psychosocial disabilities and mad people, then what alternatives should exist instead when people are experiencing acute or intense distress or crisis. And we've spent a lot of time talking about how existing legal structures in our home country in the United States do not allow for a robust network and a set of systems and programs and offerings that can be responsive to the needs of disabled people on our own terms. And we've imagined what a future might look like if people of color who are disabled, queer and trans people who are disabled, people who are not, who do not belong to the dominant religious or cultural or ethnic groups in a particular nation are disabled and wish to receive some level of intensive support around decision-making, around daily life activities, or even around one's own safety. And in particular, we are thinking about two types of scenarios, one type of scenario in which disabled people may be experiencing episodic crisis, a moment of heightened crisis or distress in which they wish to receive intensive support for a very short period of time. And secondarily, when disabled people would like to receive and would benefit from longer term intensive support around daily living, around decision making, and other aspects of our lives that are deeply and intricately tied to the exercise of our agency and autonomy. And what we've envisioned are 
operating within existing legal structures and perhaps building new legal structures to fund and to sustain types of programs that could be run by people who actually have lived experience and who are also trained as professional support workers, as people who can intervene in crisis, as people who can provide social services, as people who can provide clinical or therapeutic support, but who are doing so at all times in ultimate respect of our autonomy. What if, for example, a disabled person expresses the desire to spend a couple of days in a closed door overnight environment because they're worried about harming themselves? Should that person have access to that space? And if so, can we make that space available in a way that ultimately respects the autonomy and agency of that person to sign out whenever they choose, to be able to determine the parameters of the treatment, if any, that they receive while staying in this location? to change their mind about when they wish to leave, to be able to ask in advance, even if I say that I want to leave tomorrow, don't let me leave for another two days. How can we provide the opportunity for disabled people who have actually articulated a desire to be able to stay overnight somewhere in response to a particular form of crisis or overwhelm, to be able to have that space and to do so without worrying that they will lose their legal rights, that a petition might be filed against them that could find, that could create a legal finding of incapacitation, that could create a finding of, that could create a finding of uh, an absence of judgment, of, of ability to exercise judgment, and therefore ultimately end up with a court order for forced treatment, for forced institutionalization, or for the institution of a guardian. And what about when someone has expressed a desire to be able? to receive live-in or long-term support, which many disabled people do need, except that when the person's disability is a psychosocial disability or an intellectual or developmental disability, that that service is generally only made available with the expectation of institutionalization, segregation, and loss of control over one's lives. We imagine what it might look like if our social services and disability services offerings at the state and local level were able to provide disabled people with the ability to determine what kinds of services we need or require on a short-term or long-term basis, including the ability to receive residential or overnight care, including the ability to receive crisis support or intervention, but to do so from professionals who largely share experiences similar to ours, who are trained by people who have experiences like ours and whose decisions are ultimately under the purview of people whose experiences are like ours, rather than being left to the whims of non-disabled people who do not know what it is like to live in our lives, to inhabit our body minds, or to experience marginalization that we've experienced because of criminalization, because of pathologization, and because of the presumption of incompetence and incapacity. We envision a world in which care without coercion, in which abolition of all forms of institution, institutionalization and incarceration also means creating and sustaining forms of care and support that reflect the varying and diverse needs that disabled people actually have, have actually articulated and actually desire and do so in ways that ultimately are in service of respecting and expanding our ability to exercise our individual agency and autonomy and that respect our dignity and the wholeness of our humanity. I will turn it back over to you. I think um, I'm up now. Um, my name is Alicia Yeaman and I also want to add my great thanks to Vikram and Michael for inviting me to participate in the panel as well as the the workshop and the volume. Uh, I think that there's, despite the fact that a UN special rapporteur on the right to health was a psychiatrist and explored some issues, there's still far too little uh, cross fertilization between those of us who generally work on health rights and those of us uh, and, and people in the disability rights community. Um, and I think that's kind of where I want to start. I noted in Vikram's comments that he talked about uh, a number of different rights, but did not mention the right to health. And I want to start with the right to health because there is a, a general kind of 
presumption in many settings, and Alberto also referred to this, that in clinical settings, there is an ostensible trade-off between rights, between the autonomy of a person experiencing an emotional crisis and her their right to health. And the, the starting point for my piece is that that is generally not in an absolutist way, I don't adopt the absolutist position of general comment one, but generally misplaced and fallacious. Uh, so general comment 14 from the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights um, recognizes that contained in obligations to respect the right to health is the obligation of states to refrain from applying coercive medical treatments unless on an exceptional basis for the treatment of mental illness. Um, and of course, how do we define exceptional basis? Um, I argue in the piece, the general comment 14 was issued in May of 2000, well before the CRPD and, and the general comment one from the CRPD committee. Um, general comment 22 on the right to sexual and reproductive health from the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights does not list uh, psychosocial disability as an exception to free informed um, or mental illness and its exception to free informed decisions over one's body, but that, you know, that's open to interpretation. So really I look at beyond the elaboration of obligations by this or that committee, um, conceptualizing health in terms of rights, just as disability requires, in my view, upending aspects of the biomedical and conventional public health paradigms. The right to health is not merely about equity and access, although it is, and persons with different kinds of disabilities are hugely um, disadvantaged and discriminated against in that view. But the right to health also poses a challenge to the stochastic view of health imbricated in biomedicine. And as some have already suggested, it challenges the authority of clinicians uh, and including psychiatrists. A major challenge in doing right to health advocacy is to democratize health systems and health decision-making, which are, health systems are so often treated as merely technocratic apparatuses and insulated from democratic scrutiny. And I think, in the pandemic, we've seen very much that there are close ties between health systems and health policy and decision making and democratic norms of equality and dignity. So the, the idea that I start with is that, you know, biomedical knowledge, as, as Vikram suggested, like all knowledge, exists in social and political space and deploys certain framing logics. Um, and this has been increasingly recognized in health rights advocacy and in the jurisprudence of supranational tribunals. So it just happens this week that at Harvard Law School, I'm teaching a seminar on sexual and reproductive rights. And this week we're discussing obstetric violence, which creates a kind of similar disruption in epistemic framings. So, uh, you know, Within the bounds of biomedical epistemology, gestating and birthing persons are not really recognized as embodied subjects, as complex actors with epistemic agency and intentions and the right to, you know, situated freedoms in, the, in, in contexts where they are very vulnerable, which are often defined biomedically as emergencies when they're not, and they're reduced to sort of depersonalized objects to be acted upon. And I think similar kinds of dynamics are operating in many cases in psychiatry with people with psychosocial disabilities. So again, you know, building on some of the work that I have done and, and the, the literature in sexual and reproductive health, I look in the chapter toward conceptions of informed consent that have evolved over time significantly. Um, and in particular, look at a case from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights called IV versus Bolivia, um, in, which is from 2017. And in that case, the Inter-American Court 
explicitly recognize the effects of gender stereotypes on informed consent. It looks at how women are seen as vulnerable beings and capable of taking reliable or consistent decisions. Uh, they're seen as impulsive and indecisive and in need of a more stable person with better judgment, et cetera. And, and the court then notes how the power dynamics and asymmetrical interactions between medical personnel on the one hand and the patient and her family in the health system cannot be separated from structural inequalities in society and imposed an affirmative burden on the state to provide what they call active transparency, which is a concept that comes out of uh, Argentine and Colombian constitutional jurisprudence to provide, uh, proactively provide non-technical, accessible, actionable information even when people don't know what their rights are or that they have rights to mitigate some of the effects of those structural factors. That's not quite, but it's getting closer to the kind of intersubjective idea of consent that Gooding and others have suggested in supported decision making. Um, indeed, I, I believe that once we overcome this sort of reflexive idea of the incompatibility of health and disability rights, then implementing supported decision making for persons with psychosocial disabilities can reveal important aspects needed for constructing health systems and incl as inclusive democratic social institutions far more broadly. So the, the final point I make is that supported decision making cannot be seen as dichotomous. Uh, either it's substituted or it's supported, di supported decision-making when a crisis arises. A number of other people have alluded to this, but rather in terms of a range of options available for a range of disabilities, which is supported by the financing and organization of the health system, which requires stepping back from crises. And also I think uh, engaging in some degree of experimentalism in different con contexts, but such experimentalism requires addressing issues embedded in mental health service delivery models more broadly. And health delivery systems based on primary care, for example, where providers are closer to communities they serve and have personal knowledge of people in a catchment area. Some of the ideas that Vikram was talking about, community-based care, are much more likely to produce processes of communication that more accurately reflect individuals' wills and preferences. But unfortunately, as, as others as well and others have noted, in the economic north, the chronic under-resourcing of mental health systems uh, and, and neoliberal economic policies has compounded the inadequate provision of appropriate community services. It's placed stress on acute services and, and resulted in some of these inappropriate practices. In the global south, you add that the, to the low priority on mental health in general and the shackles of debt and austerity, uh, which create kind of barriers. So I'll close with saying that, you know, a little bit where Vikram started, which is I hope that this inflection point created by the pandemic, where we've seen the social determinants of uh, mental health um, uh, questions really emerge very fulsomely can cause some greater discussion among not just scholars, although I think this book is a very good place to start, but cause policymakers at national and international levels to rethink some of these models, starting with the need to really take the agency uh, and dignity of people with psychosocial disabilities seriously. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all our wonderful panelists. And I think we have about 10 minutes left. And, and this is a great moment to bring in the audience that we have here with the questions uh, that I'm going to pose to the panel. Um, the, 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 a couple of the questions are pretty, uh, pretty open. Any one of the panel can choose to answer them. Please just use your hand signal or just unmute yourself and speak. But hand signal will allow me to also see who it is. Uh, who, who, who wants to respond. So the first question, and this I think speaks to an issue that the, the, the book really did grapple with a lot, comes from Patty Gonzalez, and she asks, 
Could anyone on the panel comment on strategies to involve families slash caregivers in building a more practical understanding of legislation and what to do in cases of caring for a loved person with a serious and chronic mental illness? Of course, the issues that many of us are very familiar with that Patty is also speaking to is oftentimes the schism between what families and caregivers expect from the healthcare system towards improving the care of the person with mental illness versus the, the fundamental rights of the individual himself or herself uh, in terms of uh, the kind of care they wish to actually receive. Would anyone here um, like to address this particular question? Don't be shy. Well, this is a silent moment. Michael, can I ask you? Well, it's a very important question as we learned in the workshop because we had one third of healthcare professionals, one third of human rights individuals, and one third of those with experience, including caregivers. Um, it's the caregivers that are often overlooked, but who spend time, years, lives, uh, supporting others, family members and others. Um, and it's, it's enormously difficult, as some of us actually uh, speaking today have learned personally over the last few years. So, um, you know, the, the law is one thing and the legislation is one thing, but the most important thing is to continue doing uh, what you're doing, which is to listen to the people that you love and that you're supporting and to try to express their will and preference as best you can. Sometimes it's difficult to do so. Um, sometimes, uh, speaking just for myself, um, you know, it's, it's been very difficult trying to express the individual's preference, even when you know uh, and believe that the choice is not the best one, um, but instead honoring their human rights and honoring their, their dignity and, and autonomy. Um, and so it involves sensitivity to, to listening, um, humility, um, and, and leaving one's, one's own desires outside the door and instead honoring um, what it is that, that the other may, may choose. Um, as if for those of us who are parents, we also know that this is a difficult uh, dynamic to, to learn and to express. Thank you, Michael. Let me turn to a question from Gordon Stewart that is specifically- oh, Sorry. Um, I wanted to take a moment to address that question as well, to add a little oh, bit before we move on. Um, the question about involving uh, family members and caregivers, for me as someone who is both autistic and has psychosocial disabilities, there is a lot of baggage wrapped up in that question. Because in the world of intellectual and developmental disabilities, and to a large extent in the world of psychosocial disabilities as well, when family advocacy, that is non-professional advocacy, advocacy undertaken by people who are not clinicians or teachers or medical providers takes place historically for many decades in many countries that advocacy has been led by family members and caregivers of the people who are actually disabled and more specifically by family members and caregivers who will generally position themselves as being non-disabled. Of course, this is not including people who are openly and explicitly themselves disabled as well as being family members and caregivers to other disabled people. And that history of family advocacy is in a very fraught place where your question names the tension that non-professional family advocates have often felt when competing with professionalized advocates for space and experiencing delegitimization and dismissal of their experiences and knowledge as family members and caregivers because they were not professionals. And at the same time, that dynamic has been replicated in a different way with a very particular form of ableism where in disabled people who are self-advocating are, are similarly treated with dismissal. When we are compared to advocacy efforts when our advocacy efforts are compared to those undertaken by non-professional family members and caregivers who are not disabled. And um, one unfortunately common phenomenon is that both in the research and policymaking space, 
family members and people who are ourselves actually disabled are often treated as interchangeable in terms of our interests, what we represent, what we bring to the table, and in terms of our positionality. And that actually isn't accurate. So when folks to me, and when I'm present in a space, bring up the importance of involving family members and caregivers in policymaking, in research, or in governance, I don't dispute that family members and caregivers certainly have an important role to play and a very particular perspective to add to the conversation. But let's not forget also that family members and caregivers who are not disabled are not a stand-in for those of us who actually are disabled and that our participation is equally, if not more important than that of people who surround us who do not actually experience what it is like to be disabled. And I'll leave it there and turn it back over to Vikram. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you very much. I, I want to take the question of, of what you know. Sometimes we call as hard cases, cases uh, in which the, the the a very absolutist perspective on Article Twelve sometimes poses a, a significant challenge, uh, both for families and for for practitioners. And this is a anonymous uh, question. And you know, it, it, again, oh, I'll open it up to anyone who'd like to respond. And this really follows on from a, a recommendation, Lydia, that you made. Um, uh, but but one question that this person raises is what happens if people change their mind uh, and actually speaks about their own family member with a bipolar depression episode who kept changing her mind on whether she wanted to receive care at the hospital or not. And the question and the comment goes on and we knew she she did need the time there, but also wanted to respect her wishes when she was changing her mind. Um, yeah, and this is not an uncommon situation. As a clinician who used to work in these acute settings, it wasn't uncommon to encounter. In fact, this is common to all of us in our everyday lives. It's not just about people with mental health problems. You know, changing your mind happens all the time. Did anyone want to comment on, on what? How, how would one interpret this uh, kind of situation um, through the prism of uh, of the CRPD? Alicia, uh, Lydia, let me go to, uh, sorry, Alicia, uh, maybe, maybe you could uh, take this question. I'm happy to start. Um, I mean, I think that this shows, uh, I, I, I suppose, two things. One, uh, it surfaces some of the problems with an absolutist position. Um, two, it, it suggests that the way the health system is organized, the, the I mean, a person changing their mind in the US health system to get them in and out of the would be just, it, it's not just a legal ordeal, it's also a financial ordeal. It, it, it's, it's just an extraordinary uh, problem because there isn't space, there isn't, there, there are a whole lot of other issues. So um, I think it goes beyond supported decision making and wills and preferences. So I would say, in addition to revealing some of the problems in the absolutist position, it also shows that the way the health system is organized really has an influence on uh, the extent to which uh, people can be accommodated, right? If, it's, if, if something is done at a more community-based level where it's simpler, where people can seek care in a primary care facility, uh, things are much more straightforward than if you're checking yourself in and out of McLean um, to, to speak to a Boston audience. Thank you. Lydia? There are two concepts that might be useful here for folks that are thinking through this question. Um, one is uh, the type of planning that groups like the Fireweed Collective, formerly the Icarus Project, um, have provided worksheets on called Mad Mapping. Mad Mapping is a resource and process that people with psychosocial disabilities can use when experiencing a period of feeling more stable and feeling better in their life to be able to develop a a plan and a set of resources for what would be supportive when experiencing distress or crisis. That is the hard situations when they are not currently experiencing that particular experience. The other concept, which is a bit more mainstream and more recognized from the from the legal field, is that of a, of a psychiatric advanced directive, which is creating a directive when you are in a place of 
feeling better in your life. You are feeling supported. You have access to what you need and deciding what do I wish to happen? What do I wish to not happen if I am ever experiencing more acute distress or crisis? And um, those are tools that a person can use with support from their chosen supporters, family, partners, friends, to develop a plan of action for what would respect their wishes, what would respect their autonomy in a later scenario where they may be experiencing distress or crisis that is impacting their decision making and that is impacting their ability to express their wishes. In a similar vein as somebody may draw up an advanced directive in a very formal, legally executed sense, or in an informal way through conversations with people that they love and who support them about what they would wish to happen if they were to be in a coma or experiencing a physical health crisis. Um, so I just offer those resources to you as a starting point to explore more uh, with the family member that you mentioned and for anyone else who is listening in, an, in another relevant situation. Thank you, Lydia. Very helpful. I'm going to now hand over to Michael for the closing remarks because I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, but I encourage any of the panelists who want to follow up with any of the uh, sorry, any of the audience who want to follow up with any of the panelists, please do so through Juliana, uh, and I'm sure she'll try and connect you all uh, with us. Michael. This, this has been a, a wonderful webinar, and, and Vikram and I thank our contributors um, and the HLS Library for presenting it. For those who are watching, um, please understand that the thoughtful, respectful, insightful thoughts that you heard today represent only a fraction of those that are in the book. Um, it demonstrates just how deep and how much uh, the discussion needs to be and how much farther we need to be able to go in order to begin to understand how to fully appreciate how to empower, listen, respect the rights of persons with disabilities. Um, Vikram, I hope that I have that opportunity with you to move forward. Maya, would you like to wrap up for us? Uh, yes, thank you so much, Professor Stein. Uh, I'd like to give one more round of virtual applause for all of our speakers. Uh, thank you all so much for joining today, for sharing your insight and your lived experiences during the discussion and Q&A. Uh, I just want to sh quickly share information on our next book talk. Uh, our next Harvard Law School Library book talk will be next week, Tuesday, April 5th at 1230 p.m. on Zoom for the book, The Hughes Court from Professor Progressivism to Pluralism, 1930 to 1941, by Mark Nushnet, with panelists Nicholas Bowie, Richard Fallon Jr., Kenneth Mack, and Adrian Vermeule. Uh, you can read more about the book and register for the Zoom link on the Harvard Law School Library website. Uh, so once again, thank you to all of our speakers and to our audience for joining us today, uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>